Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dark Rhino Security, Security Confidential. Today, we have an awesome guest with us. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Ron Eddings joins us. Ron is a cybersecurity advocate. He is a creative director and podcast executive producer. Uh, so he should be at home on this show. Uh, Ron, <laughs> uh, additionally, Ron really is the real thing when it comes to cybersecurity. You know, he's been a practitioner. He has worked as a security architect at notable firms like Demisto and Palo Alto Networks. He is currently the executive, or I'm sorry, the creative director at Axonius and is also the co-founder and executive producer of Hacker Valley Studios. Welcome to the show, Ron. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. A pleasure. You know, it's uh, it's an honor in so many ways. You're somewhat of a celebrity out there. So <laughs> we we get our own celebrity. That that's that's fantastic. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's kick this off. It's always interesting on people's journeys as to how they got here, right? And and one of the things that I read when I was looking at your profile was that you describe yourself as a cybersecurity advocate. How? How did that happen? How did you become one? <laughs> Before I answer this question, because this is like such a why question. It is a why question. You want the you want the long, long answer? We gotta abbreviate a little bit or give it like you know what? I answer. want I want the answer that you want to let our listeners know. Okay. okay. So th- so our aim is to to make sure we ju- we have you for an hour and be respectful of that time but we want yeah. you to tell our listeners what you want them to know about that because how you answer it may actually impact someone out there and that would be the greatest thing in the world. Let's let's try it out. So there's two stories that are kind of intertwined. The first story is how I got started in cybersecurity. It's a kind of a long story but we'll abbreviate it a little bit. Um, I would say that I'm a son of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity, wow. to okay. me, feels like family. To some degree, it feels like a brother. To some degree, it feels like a like a mom or a dad because it's provided me so much support. When I was young and you know into sports, trying to be into technology, I, I felt like I was on the middle of the fence. Some of my friends are really into sports, and I like sports, but I didn't love it. And some of my friends were into other things like music and video and audio, but I didn't have anybody that really could connect with me on technology. And I would linger and bring my friends into AOL chat rooms and we would talk crap to each other. We would talk about sports. We would talk about our lives. Now, you know, that just dated you a whole bunch. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And one day we were talking crap in a chat room and I was talking crap to the wrong person. They sent me a file on AOLs through a feature called direct message. Shout out to I anybody remember that. that knows I, about I that. remember. I know that one well. <laughs> so they sent me a file. And at this point, I'm like 13 or 14. Of course, I open it. And my CD-ROM drive starts opening and closing. My computer starts rebooting. Long story short, this person sent me a virus. And <laughs> the first thing I thought is, I have to fix this because this is a family computer. If my mom finds out what happened, I'm in deep trouble. So I went back into the room and I asked the guy, hey, how did you do that? Please tell me. I bugged him, kept sending him a message. I I felt more like, you know, one of these bots that he had than his own bots. Like I was. Oh, he probably regretted this decision. But he did help me. And he, he, he set me on a path. And. Ultimately, I I ran into a mentor when I was working at a public access channel. I just had this realization the other day that really like my start in cybersecurity came from film. I was working at a public access channel and a gentleman walks in and his name is Marcus Carey. He he says, hey, Ron, I see that you're reading this book on CCNA or or do you think that you know about IT and networking? And I was like, "Uh, I do, but I'm a hacker. (laughs) <laughs> and he thought it was hilarious. Marcus has gone on to write many books. He he wrote yeah. the Tribe of Hacker series. And he also gave me a roadmap on how to become great in the field. He said, if you do these things, read these books, go get these certifications, you can create your own path. You don't have to go to a traditional college or anything like that. You could make your own path. And this was the first advocate that I had in my life from a personal perspective, but also from a cyber perspective. And as I started to make my way into the field, 
I worked at places like Booz Allen Hamilton as a consultant. You mentioned Demisto and Palo Alto Networks. I was working in customer success. And I realized that my purpose isn't necessarily to build tech from scratch. It's to support those that are working in cybersecurity to be their best selves. I love being a consultant, uh, providing help where I can, running off after I'm not needed, and even doing that from a content perspective. Creating content, awesome. I, I've spent the past 15 years of my life learning about cybersecurity. I thought it'd be great if I spent the next 15 years teaching people about it, talking about it, and being an advocate for others that are working in the field. That's that's fantastic. And and I love the fact that uh, you encountered someone that was willing to guide you down a non-traditional path. So you you weren't cluttered with all the the formalities. You you were able to pursue a passion. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I, I, I got to ask the question, though, what did what was Marcus's guidance like? What were what was his roadmap to greatness? <laughs> Because, I mean, you can't say that and then not have me ask that question because someone's going to want to know. So what do I got to read, man? Give me. I, I was so lucky when I met Marcus, he walked into this public access studio and he wanted to do a bit on cybersecurity. And it wasn't just him. He brought in two other Allmark names. One of the people that he brought in was Johnny Long. Johnny Long is a pioneer of Google hacking. And he also brought in Joe McRae. Joe okay. McRae is, you know, someone that has yeah. taught offensive tactics since for quite I got some time. Yeah, <laughs> he's been around the block quite a bit. And <laughs> both of these people, in addition to Marcus, all took me under their wing. Marcus was telling me more about uh, how to mature myself as a practitioner, how to really understand technology from like a requirement level, but to also understand it from, hey, everything is an API. You just need to learn how to understand an API. There's that's a, a form of communication. And Joe's mm. thing was become the baddest, most dangerous hacker that you can become. That that was powerful to me as a youth, seeing someone that can break into computers, pop a shell, and also look cool while doing it. He's a, he's a hilarious person, so he just made it look so cool and effortless. And did he have any advice on good lawyers while you're doing that? <laughs> <laughs> He, he told me about one great one called Don't Get Caught. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's uh, astute advice. So, but when you, when you look at what Marcus was saying, he was trying to create a mindset there. What, what is that, that mindset? That mindset of a hacker, that mindset of someone that is pursuing a passion. I, you know, what's going on internally? Because I think that matters way more than the actual knowledge itself in many ways. Yeah, it's been an evolution over the years. When I first was learning about technology and cybersecurity, it was become the best. I, I had an ego and I wanted to make a lot of money doing it. And I Not thought, wrong with that. <laughs> this, is, this is the most clear path for wealth. My parents were very relaxed. They didn't necessarily care about my grades. They didn't care about what I did after school, they just really made sure that I came home before dark and that I wasn't, you know, acting like a nuisance or someone that is um, bad by nature. But yeah. what I also learned when pursuing this thing called wealth, financial wealth, is that financial wealth isn't the only type of wealth. There's also personal wealth, there's spiritual wealth, and also physical wealth. And I, I started to see that Learning about cybersecurity is an auxiliary skill for me. When I learn more about cybersecurity, I learn about the world. I learn about offensive tactics, defensive tactics. There's a lot of military uh, you know, there. synonyms and uh, parallels. Then there's also a lot of chess. So I, over the years, I've really been learning about the topics that can make me better at cybersecurity, but aren't necessarily cybersecurity related. And one example I have on for that today is I just started doing Tai Chi okay. and it's all about, you know, moving your energy. It's a way to also have some physical movement and meditate yeah. um, and using your energy in the right way is how you become a superhero. It's how you tap into your superpower. If you're able to tap into your superpower and I could tell you that mine is um, providing 
strategic and tactical solutions for people to benefit from. These can be technology. These can be ideas. These can also be, you know, physical. If somebody wanted to know about working out, I'm always open to provide advice and feedback. And, you know, combining all of these skills over time has really been the fuel for my appetite of learning about cybersecurity and getting better at it day by day. So, you know, um, but let me ask you this in what you're describing and I'm going to paraphrase here is a deep passion to pursue for the sake of excellence. That's it. I, yes. I'm oversimplifying it. I don't, <laughs> I, I, but it, it's a very key thing. And I, I think it applies to any topic in, in uh, a human endeavor if you have that passion for the pursuit of something for the sake of and do it with excellence would it not stand to say then that yeah you'll you'll get the physical wealth you'll get the mental wealth you'll get the knowledge wealth but then the material wealth is just kind of an outcome of all of that it's a byproduct <laughs> It's not the actual goal. If it's pursued as a solitary goal, you may or may not have success. But if you for sure pursue the way you're describing it, you might have a natural outcome that might surprise you in that. It's all about your value system. If if achieving materials is valuable to you, then whatever you're doing that's not achieving you materials is going to be painful. It's going to feel like friction. and over time, I had a lot of friction on this topic because what's really important? Is it money? Is it career? Is it personal? Is it friends? Is it family? Is it all of them combined? And what are the ratios? And what I boiled it down to was my mission and vision for myself. And it's to um, gain rare and valuable skills to acquire personal and financial freedom. I started to realize the more rare skills that I have, whether it be podcasting, how to program in Python, um, things of those nature, that I could actually achieve more personal freedom, financial freedom. And when I achieve those things, I have more time for my friends, family, hobbies, and things like this podcast. That's, 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 that's awesome. You know, in, uh, in yoga, there's a uh, old, old saying, you, you might have heard about it. It's that, you know, that the mind calms the breath and then the breath masters the mind. And mm. once you've mastered the mind, you've mastered everything. You're done. <laughs> that is so true. And what's, uh, <laughs> what, what I wanted to add to that is there's also uh, this idea of mystery that is part of my story. And I think this is part of many people in cybersecurity story is this wonder of mystery and going on exploration. And what I started to realize is the best mysteries and pieces of knowledge are within you. When you look at something like intuition, being able to understand something immediately without having to reason with yourself or go to someone and ask them a question or go to Google, you just get it. Uh, when I'm dancing, I'm doing it intuitively. When I'm thinking about logic, when I'm thinking about business operations plus people plus technology, plus attack surface, and I have to solve for the attack surface, I think of how can I you know, get these other parts of the equation proactively, and I don't have to ask someone how to do this. I think you know, when you look deep down inside, you start to understand and see intuition that's already within, whether it's from nature or education, yep. and then you get to tap into it and start to unravel it see how the mind, the body, and the spirit works together. Uh, see, this is a, it's a very powerful thing. And people are probably thinking, are we on a cybersecurity podcast? <laughs> or are we on a yoga podcast of some kind or a spiritual podcast? But it's all interrelated. And I don't think the kind of success that you've had and that you're trying to propagate to others and enable them, you just, if you're not looking within, it won't happen without. It, it mm. just it just won't. I don't know if you've read the book, uh, The Alchemist by Paul Kolo. I was going to bring that up on this podcast. That's my favorite book. <laughs> uh, that's one of my. Yeah, so th th there's a one of my favorite lines in that book 
is the universe always conspires to help you. Mm -hmm. Yep. There was a lot of thought put into that one. That choice of words is uh, very intelligent. You know, that word of conspires. And, and I guess you have to create that conspiracy in some ways. Be a part of it. Yes. And what the book also talks about is following the omens. Once the universe conspires to help you, you have to take action. You have to start you, following those. Trust your events. intuition, man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and when, op when you see an opportunity, pursue it. And that's that exploration. And I guess that, that really is, you have a sense of wonder about you. How, how do you maintain that for such a long period of time and so consistently? I mean, I, I look at, um, we've had so many people on this program. We've had laughter yoga coaches on this show. We, we've had uh, New York Times bestselling authors. We've had hardcore cybersecurity uh, practitioners that get into great technical detail about things. But that sense in all cases where we saw uh, a great, personality there was that sense of wonder and it never died it it was something that kept going and without it you you lose human performance how do you on a daily basis not get turned down by the happenings and and get caught up in minutia that could derail you and just keep that focus keep going there's a few things the the first element that I would say that keeps me inspired and energized is optimism. Really looking at the world and your life as glass half full rather than half empty. If I were to fail a test or fail a certification, you know, that happens quite a bit in cybersecurity for anyone new or in the field already, or not get a job. I don't, I try not to look at it as friction or a problem, something that went wrong. I look at it as an opportunity to to behave differently, to to operate differently. So that's the the first element that keeps my my hunger for it. And the second element is journaling. I like to journal every morning. I I just started video journaling. That's a little different. And when I reflect on all the things that I've been able to accomplish, like I try to every now and again put a top ten, like top ten things that I did this year, top ten things that I did this month. When I look at that list, I think, wow, if I was able to accomplish this in a year or a month, what can I do in three months or three years? How do I start to plan and strategize towards that? So really, it's just turned into building a bigger and bigger palace for my skills, my mind and my body, and as well as my family. You know, um, there's a there's what you're saying here there's a lot of research on this so you know i read voraciously i like i read anything i get my hands on it's been a thing i, I love learning new things so whatever but uh one of the topics that that i there was a lot of uh, medical documentation on is journaling people who journal and put their thoughts down on paper every day it creates, like, even if it's something that is not positive, but it was something negative, if you put it down on paper, you create a distance between yourself and that thought, according to medical science, not according right. to me. So <laughs> I, I'm nobody on this topic. You can say according to Ron. <laughs> according to Ron. I will say according to Ron. And that eases the tension that may arise from pondering on that thing. Yes. And so it is said. So that that's worth the price of admission right there. That's a tool that everybody listening to this podcast can actually use immediately. Powerful tool. It's a very powerful tool. You just have to have the discipline to do it. But then you have to have the discipline to achieve success. It, you, you can't do it in. It's not a one time event. It's a continuum of events that you cause. So I got to ask you, what what do you think is your superpower? How would you describe it? Because you're referencing all my favorite books and quotes. So like, it seems like you're also on this journey of something similar. I am a uh, lifelong learner. You know, I love learning for the sake of learning and exploring my own limits 
to see if there are, what are they? And uh, if they are, I mean, I've done stupid things like running a marathon and I didn't look like this when I did that. I tell you guys that I it was a lot lighter and, and probably a little bit uh, <laughs> you <look great>. more <laughs> athletic. Uh, you know, I'm, I've gained a lot of weight since then, but whether it was something like that to uh, getting involved deep in mathematics, you know, by training, I'm an aeronautical engineer, although I haven't practiced that in eons, or uh, I love playing guitar and writing music. You know, I love the blues. So uh, that's, all those things are completely disparate. And yet by day, I'm a cybersecurity practitioner or executive in mm -hmm. the industry. Uh, and it's, uh, to me, all those other things enable my success in this role because I'm learning skills and it's keeping me engaged on a daily basis with something new. There's always something new. I don't know anything. That's the way I look at it. And someone can always teach me something and I can always learn something. Definitely. So, so yeah, I guess that that's my story. Well, that was a role reversal there. I, I'm supposed <laughs> to be asking the questions, but I'll answer it. I mean, I'm pretty much an open book on this thing. Um, big, you know, we do uh, one of the things that um, I got engaged with was trying to help underprivileged children get engaged in STEM. Mm hmm. Okay. And the idea being, I think a lot of times when we teach topics, and this is actually a question, so we'll, we'll get into this, but a lot of STEM topics as they are taught today, I think are overburdening. They, they really take away that sense of wonder, right? And if you don't have that sense of wonder or can't spark the imagination, it it the child will not pursue it so when you as an example talk to a high school kid or a middle school kid and ask them do you like math do you like science i bet you you're going to get a whole bunch of times they're going to say well that's hard right it's not hard that that to me is the wrong freaking mindset it's not hard why is that there whereas if we engage them early which is what we're trying to do and you give them a Lego robot and don't give them any instructions. Just say, here's some parts, man. Here's some things that I made it do. Why don't you try and make it do something? No guidance. Just sit there and put things together. If that sparks a sense of wonder in them, then everything else will start happening naturally. And there'll be plenty of time to get into the formalities of javascript and python code and <laughs> all that stuff that's important but if we start there ain't gonna happen mm -hmm. that's so. that's interesting it makes me also consider the piece of education which is how to learn uh, we only get to learn how to learn once if at all no one has really reached out to me as a student or even an adult and said, hey, Ron, I want to assess your learning capacity and ability and then help you get better at learning it. Um, you know, a lot of the times when we look at something like science, technology, we get afraid because of our capacity to learn and remember things. When I got started on this journey of rediscovering myself and reinventing myself, the first thing that I did was go back and learn how to learn again. I took this course by a gentleman named Jim Quick, and okay. he has this course called Super Brain, and he teaches you how to remember things. He teaches you how to store a, a, a speech in your mind, and I started to learn things like mnemonics, how to build a memory palace, and I thought my knowledge, my, my capacity for knowledge is abundant. I just didn't have the right filing and storing system before, you know, really getting my hands and teeth and technology the way I have it in there today. You know, uh, it's very interesting. So you, I, again, I'm going to oversimplify, but it sounds like uh, I, I'm familiar with Jim Quick. You end up creating some unstructured, like mnemonics. You're creating all these strange images in your mind and associating them to memories and it's the strangeness of it that keeps the memory alive, right? It makes you recall it. 
it's the unstructured nature of it. And, and I always go back to how does an infant learn? If we look at our children and you watch a little child, whether it's learning to walk or especially if it's learning to talk, mm -hmm. a, a child is not learning comma, period, adjective, pronouns, nouns, verbs, all that stuff, right? They're making goo goo gaga sounds. And, <laughs> and then depending on how you respond to them, they're adjusting themselves. When we teach that to an adult, what do we do? We're starting with grammar. If you try to learn a new language, it's a great example of this. It's so hard. Mm -hmm. Because we're starting with this highly structured approach, whereas real learning happens in a very unstructured way. You try it. It's okay to make a mistake. Garble something. Right. Get a reaction. Adjust yourself. Yep. There's uh, quite, a, quite a bit that I'm still unpacking about learning. And what I think is also worth mentioning is the type of learning that you're doing. Sometimes maybe it's through nurture or nature, but sometimes we glance off at a book and we can't, we can't focus on it. It's just like, I can't read it. Or people listening to audiobooks, it's like, they just can't do it. They get bored before you know it, they have their phone out or they're sleeping even worse. And some people, when they're in person, they get shelled up. They can't, they can't be around others and really be comfortable with learning, let alone performing and, you know, doing a, a, a problem taking a certification, they just aren't really that good at it. Um, and I read this other book, we're talking about a lot of books, there's this uh, free book, it's uh, a Harvard Business, Re book, Har Harvard Business Review book okay, called please. Managing Oneself. And this okay. book is about how to learn, essentially, how to manage yourself if you're this type of learner, whether it's a reader, visual, or auditory, or something else, and then surrounding yourself with those right types of people that can help support you learn, but also fill in those gaps where you're not, you know, naturally inclined or inclined through just what you know today. Yeah, I, I, we'll put a link to that. We'll find that book, <laughs> put it in the show notes. You know, maybe some folks can go out there and check it out. Um, I guess that you know comes to we're talking about learning, and we're talking in some ways about making learning fun. You look at cybersecurity, man, and there's a whole bunch of cybersecurity podcasts out there. There's a ton of cybersecurity blogs out there. Yep. There's a ton of white papers out there, depending on who's <laughs> pimping them out. I, I, you know, I'm not going to rag on people for that. I should, but I won't. Uh, but there's all this information, and it's dry as hell. How do we get the the general public engaged in our industry. When I go to a conference, it's all techies, mm -hmm. mostly. Where's the average person in this conversation who can make the biggest difference? How do we make this entertaining so that they'll say, yeah, you know what? I'm, 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 I might listen to Mr. Eddings over here, you know? <laughs> 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 How do you get a culture of cybersecurity or get that in, your, in the general population's thinking? In my mind, I think I have part of the answer. And I want to okay, like please. walk through with you. Maybe we'll find some truth or flaws to my answer. But what comes to mind first is accessibility. When you think of the word accessible, what comes to your mind? That yeah, I can grab at it in two seconds and I'll understand it in two seconds. I put Boom. both of those together. That's it. That's it. Imagine wanting one of those white papers. You want to oh go read God. one of these white papers, or even better, you are assigned by your boss to learn about all the EDR technologies out there. Like, all right, I need oh, to learn man. about endpoint detection and response. How do I go about doing that? Oh, there's these companies that have EDR products. I'll go learn from them because they're pioneering the subject. Well, you go to their website. The first thing that they want you to do is exchange value. Pretty much buy something. You have to enter in your email address in order yes. to get access to that content, whether it be the webinar or ebook sure. or even sometimes training. Um, when you look at the resources like Udemy or Udacity, you know, they have some pretty decent cybersecurity content, but still there's 
a gate there. You have to buy that. Um, I think accessibility is the first thing. Um, okay. Once we make cybersecurity accessible where people can access it freely, like you were saying, in two seconds, grab it. There's a few other things that we have to do. We have to make sure that the content is fresh, not fresh from this is breaking news perspective, but fresh as in when you take a bite out of it, you get a great taste. When <laughs> I eat a piece of fruit, if it's spoiled, I spit it out. Yeah, I never take a fun. bite of it again. But if it's delicious, I keep going back. So it's through education and entertainment. And you combine those two together, you have edutainment. And I think that's one of the components after accessibility is reached to where we can start bringing in more and more people. There is one other thing I got to mention, though, that you I know that you, you work on with your company, with your podcast, and even as an individual, and that's the youth. We can't make a change without affecting the youth. We yes. have a tremendous amount of programs to help people get into college programs, um, degree programs, scholarships, certifications. But what about making it accessible again? You still have to know that these things exist. You have to know someone to really get your start in cybersecurity today. Um, if we spoke to the young, I'm, spe I'm talking about elementary school. That's when you know kids have this appetite to learn and they, they can do it so quickly. But the older that we get, the more stubborn that we are, we start to have good habits and bad habits. And we also aren't as curious. Uh, and, and for that crowd, it better really be fresh, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> we and start elementary. <laughs> it better be fun, right? Uh, if we start elementary kids off with the CCNA, good luck. Have fun. Right. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Uh, so the <laughs> let me ask you about Hacker Valley Studios. And is, is that part of your mission is to make things accessible and bring infotainment to this or what's going on there with? Yeah, with, that's with exactly part of our mission. And, you know, what we're doing, our mission in you know, simple words is to explore the intersection between cybersecurity, technology and humanity. And while we're doing this, and why we're doing this, we created the goal to create this astonishing content, this content that's fresh, but also content that is good for people, people inside of cybersecurity, people that aren't in cybersecurity, because, you know, you may work in the industry, you may not, yeah. but that doesn't mean there's not anything to learn. There's always something to learn. And that's what we hope to provide is just something for people to learn and also enjoy. Uh, that's uh, that's fantastic. So I, I'll have to check out some of the content up there. I, you know, because again, it's such a dry topic, man. I I look at some of these things and I'm like, man, <laughs> I might just fall asleep trying to get through this darn thing. Come, give me something that that that's fun. You know, I you know, for example, you know, one thing that I often see that we have this uh, focus on technology, but you mentioned humanity. And part of that humanity framework to me is the hackers psychology themselves. There is no school that I know of that actually, other than US Cyber Command, they're the only ones that do this, that talk about the psychology behind hacking. To know your adversary, right? Mm -hmm. And and I sit on the board at Slippery Rock University, and I've been trying to get those guys to get this into their computer science department for kids who want to get into cyber. You got to teach them about the adversary. Learn about the human aspects of it. How do you socially engineer something? How do I make it delightful that you want to take a bite out of my fruit when I want to do something bad to you? Right. Right. I think those would be hilarious topics to actually explore. They could be done in a fun way and they might educate a lot of people on how things go north, south, not north. How they go south. <laughs> Both are important. <laughs> Both are important. <laughs> right. So I, I, I look forward to seeing a lot more content there from you guys. That that's, that'll be great. And if you want us to share some of the stuff, you know, tweet it out or, Put it on Instagram. We'll we'll make sure that we uh, push it. it out. We'll 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 push it out to our audience as well. Thank you. 
So let's go to a man. We are running out of time. There's no way we're getting through all this. <laughs> um, let's go to the most basic and the perhaps I'm going to ask the dumbest question in the world. Uh, what is the value of cybersecurity? Who cares? That is a question that many people are asking themselves, whether it's from a positive perspective and <laughs> trying to provide more value or from a negative perspective and just being so annoyed from cybersecurity and these teams and, and leaders, like, what are they trying to do to my, my, my work and my, my productivity? Um, but the value of cybersecurity is pretty simple in my mind. It's to provide security for technology, anything cyber related. Cyber could be uh, a server, laptop, IoT resource. But, you know, we're starting to see that this term of cybersecurity is, is very vast. And it's hard to say, yes, I, I work in cybersecurity or versus I work in incident response, vulnerability management, because how can we really do cybersecurity? That's a question that I don't think anyone has really solved. Otherwise, there would be one company out there that it, it has all the customers and has all the, all the knowledge and companies are a lot more safe. But cybersecurity is, it can really help secure your technology and provide opportunities for your team to be productive and collaborate freely. Um, we don't always see that. And sometimes we actually see the opposite where cybersecurity helps business operations. These are the teams and, and leaders that really understand communication, collaboration. See, now and that's very rare. Yeah. I've only worked at, for the most part, organizations when I was doing corporate security where the, the leaders and team did not understand business operations. We could make a lot of money as a company if we help the business, if we help the business optimize and scale and succeed. But I think something is missing in our mindset when we're learning or being mentored when we're breaking into cybersecurity to really know that when we get started. Isn't that a two-way street, though? Because it, there, there's something broken on our side. But when you look at the executive side of the house, the business leaders, they still think cyber, many of them, not all of them, many of them still think it's just uh, a technology-based conversation. And there's a, what's the new silver bullet of the day kind of a thing. Right. <laughs> they, <laughs> they really do. And it wasn't until 2015 to where I saw how security could help business operations succeed and scale. And that was when I started to see AppSec engineers, engineers that really understood the code and understood the application because they have to work with so many teams to get it right. They have to work with the stakeholders who have the idea for the application. Yeah. They have to work with the developers when they find issues and flaws. And they also have to work with um, sometimes the customer to help remediate those security flaws. And it's such a balancing act that you have no choice, but to have to start to understand how to make pay people succeed. When you learn that your job is not going to be successful. If someone else's job is not going to be successful, you start to help them. And beforehand, when we just had analysts working in a sock and they didn't know the organization, I can't see how they could help the business scale if they don't understand the, the culture and the way it works and the, the pain points of the, the employees. I, I couldn't, uh, couldn't agree with you more. Uh, it's um, getting. Well, before I go down that question, let me, do you have an example of this? Like where a, a business case where a simple study that, you know, you guys are trying to do X and the CyberSec team made this really possible and scalable. Vulnerability management is always a great example in my mind because there's so many areas that you can help the business with. One obviously is vulnerabilities and eliminating those but what about misconfiguration, finding flaws with how users are operating with that application? Sometimes you may think, oh, there's a bug here. I'm just work around it and not say anything. But security can help you know, team members find when those configurations aren't aligned with either policy or practices of the organization. And when you know, you're looking at vulnerability management, helping the organization, there's also the idea of cost. 
once you start to yeah. get a lay of the land, you talked about know thyself. I mean, know that the, the, thy enemy. I think it's also about know thyself, understanding all of the assets you have within your environment and being able to say, what's all here? Whether it's a laptop, like I said earlier, or even a SaaS Ooh, That's app. a tough question, man. <laughs> I tell you. Imagine if you knew all the SaaS applications you had and you knew how much they cost you each year. You can say, hmm, Ron hasn't logged into this application along with 30 other people in the past year. We could save maybe $100 per seat, $1,000 per seat if we got rid of those users or spoke to our vendor and said, hey, instead of us paying for someone that logs in only during audits, let's not do that and let's try to renegotiate. Give us a free seat. Um, you know, security can help with those types of examples. And I think that's just scratching the surface. Oh, yeah. I, I'll I'll throw one out there. We uh, worked with a retailer, a major retailer, and used identity and access management to consolidate their loyalty programs across all their brands. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like if you go shop at store A, you create uh, an identity. You go to store B, you create an identity. Well, they're the same people. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and and if you own right there was a case where they didn't know that those are the same people so when you look at trying to do metrics on what does this personality buy right across my brands well if you consolidate and you can track those identities now you know what they buy and if you know what they buy you know what to sell to them now you've gone from a cost center to a revenue center yes there's also another thing that I just thought of that I think makes security fun. One app comes to my mind and it's Okta. Everyone that I have ever heard speak about Okta has <laughs> always been public, publicly and, and uh, positively. Like, hey, let me talk to IT and get you added to Okta for that app. Let me make yeah. sure you get the right permissions. And then, you know, all of this starts to come together and you feel good. And you don't feel good just because you have access to your application, but you feel good because you don't have a password. Passwords have always been the bane of our existence. I don't even like remembering my password personally. I wish oh, that there they, was they are. <laughs> some other type of way to authenticate along with another, you know, I would still like to do multi-factor, but I don't want to do the password thing. Um, so I think Okta really makes security fun by not having to do yet another password. Yeah, that's a cool point. We do a lot of work with them. So we've done all kinds of <laughs> interesting, <doesn't? laughs> proje uh, interesting projects with those guys. So I'm going to skip some questions here because we're not going to get through all this. I, I hope we at some point are able to get you back and get into more details on other things. But one thing I know our audience would love to know is between the InfoSec programs that you've seen that worked and the ones that were just really shitty, what, what differentiated, what was the difference between the two? There's some gaps, some obvious things that, that might differentiate them. Yeah, I have a few examples that came to my mind, and I'll say a strategic gap and also a tactical gap. And I'll okay. start with tactical. Um, tactical. A tactical gap that I see quite a bit, which bleeds into strategic, is not understanding why you're doing something. Many security practitioners that I've worked with, they'll, you know, have some big company that they worked at and, you know, done a lot and learned a lot. And then they go to another organization and think, well, all right, I'll just do that at this organization as well. And you don't understand how this business works. What are the requirements? Why is this application in the environment that it is, whether it's, you know, a geographic environment or development environment, all the way to who is this serving? If you are re reviewing information as a security analyst or engineer and your output serves no one but yourself, then that could that could turn into a really big problem from layoff to your 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 stakeholders not understanding the value of security or even right. worse. Hence the dumb question, why is cybersecurity important? Why do we <laughs> care? Who cares? Uh, you, thanks for reinforcing that, but please keep going. Didn't mean to interrupt there. And the ta the strategic uh, bit that I've seen security programs, not really that, that hinder security programs 
is culture, not having the right culture, yeah. having very different personalities that don't get along great, um, but also not fostering a culture for people to start to adapt to and understand when companies have their mission, vision, and, and values, anyone at the organization has a North Star. They have the mission. Like, okay, well, yeah. what's the bigger picture? And you look at the vision and it's like, all right, how do I stay aligned to who I am, but also who the company is while going towards that mission and vision? That's where your values come into place. Um, when organizations have that from a organizational level to a team level, everyone knows what to do to some extent. There's still problems and challenges to solve, but at least people will be marching in a unified direction. Yep. And, you know, that culture of security, that's the people and process side of the equation. So maybe I guess the question would be, instead of framing it as what's the value of cybersecurity, should we more better frame it as what is the value of information security? Because that will now include people and process into this, which is typically left out of the equation a lot of times. <laughs> Not always, a lot of times though. And cause you to lack that culture of security. Right. Just saying, I don't know. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. I, I <laughs> the, That's an interesting assessment and question because we would like cybersecurity teams or information security teams to be able to help with everything. But if a process has a flaw, a flaw that's introduced outside of the technology, I think it's part of the responsibility for the security team to help remediate and resolve. But it's a, it's a group effort. Organizations that do security great, it's not just on the security team to make determinations and make policies. It's a collaborative effort, especially even incidents and yes. alerts. I've worked absolutely as a consultant where I've where I've worked with organizations where they're the person that is maintaining the application is on the call when there's an incident. The person that is helping customers outside of an engineering support is on the call because they're able to say, hey, this is suspicious activity. How would a security team member know that my uh, storefront web application has suspicious activity outside of brute forcing, you know, the run of the mill security, like right. knowing user patterns and behaviors. That's what the application, the stakeholder uh, really starts to understand and can help articulate to security team members. Having that tribe to help, you know, raise all those that high tide is, you know, what I've found, uh, what I've seen to be successful for security programs and teams. What about uh, security teams that are really just cops and are always just saying no? Is that not a disabler to that culture of security? It, and, it is. And an enabler for shadow IT, I guess, you know, <laughs> because that. It is. And those days are numbered. We're getting to a point in our society, especially through digital transformation, where we don't have the control like we used to. We're not working out of an office place and. Sometimes we're not even using our corporate laptops and resources to access business critical processes, yeah. sensitive data. And when you look at the sprawl of SaaS applications as well, my Slack has access to my Zoom. My Slack also has access to Google Drive. What does yes. Google Drive have access to? What has access to Google Drive? You know, this sprawl makes it almost impossible to, to be the department of no for security teams. So those days are numbered and we just have to figure out the way to start saying yes or yes, but. I love it. We are running out of time here and I wanted to give you the floor for the last two minutes to plug anything you'd like to, anything you got coming up. Uh, you doing any talks, writing any books, new podcasts, what's going on that you want our audience to know about? Yeah, we got a lot of things going on. Uh, the first uh, place is always the easiest to check out. That's HackerValley.com. We have 10 shows at the moment. We push out shows multiple times a week. We have shows ranging from uh, the intersection of technology and humanity, like I was speaking about with Hacker Valley Studio, but all the way to 
Hacker Valley Red and Blue that explores the mindset and the capabilities of offensive and defensive practitioners, all the way to a new show that we just launched about uh, five months ago called Technically Divided. And this show is about the most divisive topics cool. in technology and cybersecurity. Ooh. But, you know, we say that we're divided, but ultimately we're all on one team. And the last resource that I would highly recommend everyone to check out, especially if you wanted to work with me in a technology or architectural level is Exonius. I work for Exonius as a creative director. I work hand in hand with the sales team, the sales engineering team, the product team, the product marketing team. And I marry all that information together to make sure that everyone has the access. It's accessible about asset management because that is the first pillar of cybersecurity. Do not go, do not pass go, do not collect 200 <laughs> until you understand your asset inventory because how can you protect what you can't see? Well, that's the obvious, but it's not so obvious. <laughs> it's a dark rhino. I, it is, man. <laughs> it it really is. Hey, we love our rhinos, man. They're they're good. But uh, with that, uh, Ron, really appreciate you being on the show. It was really a privilege and an honor to have you here. Thanks for doing this. And we hope to don't be a stranger. You know, when you got something new going on out there, feel free to come on. We'd love to share. Love it. And likewise, the door is always open. Can't wait to have you on ours. <laughs> I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody.